Welcome to Sword of the Spirit, written and presented by Colin Dye, Senior Minister of Kensington Temple and leader of London City Church. Sword of the Spirit is a dynamic teaching series equipping the believers of today to build the disciples of tomorrow. We pray that you find these programs inspiring and a catalyst in deepening your knowledge of God, your relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, and your intimacy with the Holy Spirit. Hello and welcome to the Sword of the Spirit, a school of ministry in the Word and the Spirit. The topic this series is Ministry in the Spirit. We've been looking at the wonderful privilege we have as believers in Jesus Christ, as followers of Christ, to serve Him and to serve others. Just as Jesus is the great servant of all, so He's called us also to lay down our lives in service of others. And in this series, we're going to look at all the different ways in which we're called to serve one another and to serve God. We've been studying the healing ministry, the fact that God is still healing people today in the name of Jesus. But right now we're in the middle of teaching on the deliverance ministry. And this begins with the greatest deliverance of all, the deliverance from our sin, to know that God has forgiven us. But also, God shows us that in the name of Jesus, we have authority to speak words of freedom to people who are in bondage to all different forms of spiritual oppression and activity of the enemy. Demonic power is overcome in the name of Jesus. And now, in this session, we're going to look at how the deliverance ministry operated in New Testament times through the life of the disciples and also how that will have an effect on how you and I minister today. Jesus gave his disciples authority to trample over serpents and over scorpions and to, to walk in freedom and liberty and victory. And that's the same authority that is given to us. The name of Jesus Christ has not lost its power. All authority has been given to me, Jesus said. That's why he said, go in my name and make disciples of all nations. We have nothing to fear because the power of Christ in deliverance that we're about to see in the teaching of the New Testament is the same power that's available today. God bless you as you watch and listen today in this vital topic of ministry in deliverance. Hello and welcome back to this session on teaching concerning deliverance, the deliverance ministry. We're looking at ministry in the Holy Spirit and we're now seeing that if you're going to minister in the Holy Spirit that will involve confrontation with demonic forces. When Jesus ministered, he preached the gospel, he taught, he healed sicknesses and cast out demons. And he never sent anybody else to preach the gospel of the kingdom without also giving them authority to heal diseases and to cast out demons. And so we see that Deliverance ministry is an important part of ministry in the Holy Spirit. Now, when Jesus came, he came to undo what the devil did. 1 John chapter 3 and verse 8 tells us, For this purpose was the Son of God manifested, that he would destroy the works of the evil one. The word destroy there means undo. And ultimately, Jesus is going to undo everything that the devil has done. And even in creation itself, he's going to completely reverse the situation. And in the coming of the kingdom of God in our lives by the Holy Spirit, he is also beginning to change us and to deal with the devil's works on the inside of us. When Jesus came, he spoke from that synagogue in Nazareth that the anointing of God was upon him, quoting, of course, Isaiah chapter 61. And he said, I've come to bring deliverance to the captives. And so in a very real sense, the whole ministry of Jesus is a ministry of deliverance. And that ministry climaxed at the cross where Jesus paid the price for the sins of the world and also defeated Satan and the host of, the, of wickedness, the powers of darkness, totally defeated there at the cross of Jesus Christ. And so, when we look at the ministry of Jesus in detail, we find him frequently casting out demons, frequently confronting evil forces. Now, the expression... Casting out demons, I admit, it's a little bit clumsy. 
Uh, maybe we ought to use the word deliverance, but then deliverance is a very broad word describing everything that Jesus has done to set us free from sin, death, hell, the grave, Satan, demons, sicknesses, and so forth. So we're probably stuck with casting out demons or demon expulsion. There are eight incidents in the gospel which are recorded of Jesus casting demons out. Eight separate gospel stories. We have the deliverance of the Capernaum demoniac, and that's a very interesting one because it happens right at the very beginning of Jesus' ministry in Galilee, following straight on after his announcement, the kingdom of God is at hand, repent and believe the gospel, and then he goes and preaches in the synagogue and confronts this demonic force. Mark 1, 21, uh, they went into Capernaum, and immediately on the Sabbath, he entered the synagogue and taught. And there in the synagogue, there was a demonic manifestation, and Jesus dealt with it. So the gospel writers bring deliverance ministry right up front, because when the king is coming, the powers of darkness are going to be shaken. When the kingdom of heaven is advancing, the kingdom of Satan, not that it really is a kingdom, but still what he calls a kingdom, is being pushed back. So the Capernaum demoniac. Then we also have the deliverance of Peter's mother-in-law. And uh, you may suggest that this is a rather questionable reference because it's talking about her being healed from a fever. But the way in which Jesus rebukes the fever uses the same word that he uses that is used of him rebuking demons. And we'll come back to that point, and I think it was something along the lines of a demonic deliverance as well. Then we have the deliverance of the blind and dumb demoniac. Then we have the Gadarene demoniacs. There were two of them in one of the gospel stories. We focus usually on just the one, but there were two, the Gadarene demoniacs. Then the Canaanite's daughter. Then the epileptic demoniac. And the crippled woman. The, and then the dumb demoniac. Well, you might talk about this word demoniac sounds like a, a rather rabid term, and you will find that uh, demonization is probably a better term, and it describes the full range of demon affliction, and the demon, demons afflict in so many different ways as we shall come to and see. Then on top of those eight instances, there are ten general statements about Jesus' deliverance ministry. And these are extremely important because they are summary statements of the kind of things that Jesus did, as it were, on a regular basis. Matthew 4, verse 24 is one of them. Let's read it. Then his fame went throughout all Syria, and they brought to him all sick people who were afflicted with various diseases and torments, and those who were demon-possessed, epileptics and paralytics, and he healed them. Now, the translation here, New King James, says demon-possessed. I don't think that's a particularly helpful translation, and we shall see why shortly. I prefer the term demonized and demonization, and we will come to that in a little while. But this goes to show that there is a very important place for deliverance ministry or delivering people from demonic influences as we are ministering the way Jesus ministered. Now, rather like Jesus' healing ministry, we can notice certain pointers. First of all, Jesus set people free from demons as they were brought to his attention. So when Jesus ministered healing, he ministered to those who came to him requesting healing. So also with demonic deliverance. Often, the sufferer or their representative would come, or when somebody was... Uh, afflicted in some way, and Jesus was called to do something about it, or they brought the demonized person to Jesus. And um, so we can see that Jesus then ministered to those who were brought to him needing help. And uh, we also understand from this that Jesus, too, went to those who needed this ministry deliberately. So he didn't just go or wait for them to come to him. He went deliberately to people who were demonized to minister to them. And he did this, obviously, in the same way that he went to heal people, under the direction of the Father. He only did what he saw the Father doing. So we have here, in Mark chapter 5, one of the clearest examples of this, where, with the healing of the Gadarene demoniacs. Now, it could not be a coincidence 
that Jesus landed at that point, at that place, at that time. He came there to that precise spot with the express purpose of setting that man free. Jesus sought him out to help him and to minister to him so he'd be released from demons. Now, where it says that Jesus was uh, rebuking the demon, he, it, the tense suggests that he was doing this for some time. In other words, it, it was a process that, that he, as soon as he arrived there, he was rebuking this demon. So Jesus went there prepared, ready, and actively dealing with the situation as he confronted it, which suggests to me strongly that the Father had sent him there specifically to do that specific thing. The other case of the woman who was crippled with a crippling demon in the synagogue, obviously when Jesus saw her physical consequence and of the physical consequence of Satan's work in her life, he had compassion on her and wanted to deal with it, um, and so obviously that was again the Spirit prompting him and showing him what God wanted him to do, what the Father wanted him to do. And if we therefore are going to minister in the Spirit, we will find there will be people brought to us and we'll come across who need deliverance ministry. And also the Holy Spirit at times will show us people who need it and will send us to them to set people free in the wonderful name of Jesus. Now the second thing we notice, the way Jesus ministered to people afflicted by demons, is that he asked few questions. Now I'm probably having to teach this because of the circumstances that we find ourselves in today, because there are many weird and wonderful so-called exorcists, and they do all kinds of weird and not so wonderful things. And uh, one of the teaching is, is that you must have lengthy conversations with demons. And uh, now, now, I don't tell you this for the, for the humor value. It is an absolutely pathetic story, but if you laugh, I do understand because it is in one sense ridiculously funny and, and, and ridiculously, what shall I say, pathetic. But uh, there was one pastor who was very involved in this kind of ministry, and he got more and more interested in having discussions with demons, even to the point of him having suspected that his wife was seeing another man. So he went to a person who was demonized, and in the process of casting that demon out, he said, uh, what was my wife doing last Tuesday? So you can see how some, I'm glad nobody laughed. Good, I said, look, you can get so carried away if you're not careful and stick to the, to the Bible in these matters. There's a whole load of stuff which is not in the Bible that people teach and people practice. Don't have discussions with demons. I don't want to talk to a demon. If a demon screams, tell it to shut up. And then tell it to get out. Don't have discussions. Don't talk. Don't ask all these kind of questions. Now, all right. Also, it seems that Jesus did not spend a great deal of time talking to the person about, well, when did this demon enter you? What happened, that, and, and look at all the kind of uh, questions that people teach are necessary for a demon to come out. I don't, I don't agree with that. You don't find Jesus entering into that. When he sees a demon, he casts the demon out. It's as simple as that. Now, there may be occasions where we will need some information, particularly if the Holy Spirit is leading us to ask the kind of questions. Jesus asked the question once, how long has this child being in this condition. And so he wanted to find out certain things about that situation. And uh, because this has been the child, the, the, the young person had that since childhood, Jesus was examining the nature of the case, the nature of the situation. You may need to ask those kind of questions, but all I'm saying here and now is that you don't need to know everything about this demon, what happened to it, how it came in, and all the rest of it, uh, and all the details that some people teach you need to know. You just need to know two things. The demon's there, number one, but number two, it's coming out in the name of Jesus. You need to know there is a demon there. You can't cast out what isn't in. You've got to know that there's a demon there, and that's got to be clear. You start casting demons out of somebody who hasn't got any, you will have a damaged person, and that person may even be you. If, if the other person uh, turns on you in one way or another. But you certainly will be damaging that person. Okay, so 
the cause of the demonic bondage can be significant. It can be significant. Let me tell you a, a story about this, and I, I hesitate to tell too many stories because I don't want to teach you from my stories. I want to teach you from the, from the Bible. But uh, there was a time when we had begun a week's fast in the church, and uh, very early in, in, in the fast, I think on the Sunday, the uh, person was presented and for prayer at the front of the church. It was quite clear this person was demon, demonized, and we began to pray, and I felt that it was not the right time to deal with this person. I felt that the circumstances weren't right, that the preparation wasn't there. So I made an appointment and asked them to bring the person to see me on the Wednesday. And during that time, we continued with the prayer and fasting. And come Wednesday, a very strong anointing was upon us as we ministered to this person, but they never showed up for his appointment. And so we called the number and said, please, where is the, where is the person? And they said, oh, he, he can't move. He's, he's sort of rigidly paralyzed. The demon has absolutely taken control of him. So I said, put him on the phone. And so they put the phone to his ear, and I said, come here in the name of Jesus. And he got up and came. And so I knew it, it was beginning to go well. And uh, then when the man sat down in the counseling room, I saw immediately by the Spirit what had happened. And these are the words I said. You will be set free from this demon when you repent of the prostitutes that you have been visiting in recent times. And they all looked at him, and he was horrified. It was all accurate. So he said, yes, it's true. I repent. And he was instantly set free. And they wrote to me later, he went back to his home country, wrote to, him, wrote to me later, and shared with me how that had happened. And so there are times when you need to understand what the link is, what the entrance point is, what the root of this is, what the landing strip is, what the area of darkness that, that there is in order for the demon to be there. But usually, especially when, you're, when people are coming to Christ, I'm not talking about believers now, especially when people are unbelievers. It's just a question of using the name of Jesus Christ and doing that, moving powerfully in the Holy Spirit. And then when a person's a believer, because of the willful nature of their condition, you may need to minister uh, in this other way of finding out exactly what has happened in that person's life to allow this level of demonic influence. Also notice that Jesus spoke directly to the demon. He didn't ignore the sufferer, but the real uh, relevance of deliverance ministry is that you address the demon, not the person. You address the demon. Now, you need to speak to the person and establish contact with the person and so forth and talk to the person, counsel the person, teach the person. Yes, but at the end of the day, de demon expulsion is about addressing the demon. Time and time again, we see Jesus spoke to the Spirit and he commanded the spirit to leave. He commanded the spirit certain things, to do certain things. Okay, that's an important principle. Now, what did he do? What did he say? First of all, he said, be bound. Be bound. Okay. Um, now, in certain cases, he also says, be quiet, which uh, is a, a translation of a word meaning to muzzle, to muzzle. And Mark 1, 26, the Spirit gave a loud cry, and he says, be quiet. Okay, 1, 25, Mark 1, 25, Jesus rebuked him, saying, be quiet and come out of him. Mark 1, 26, the demon, uh, the unclean spirit had convulsed him and cried out with a loud voice, he came out. Um, so, you see, it means to muzzle. So he bound them. To muzzle means to silence here in this, in this context. And so, when Jesus ordered unclean spirits to be bound, he, he was restricting them. And sometimes this involves silence or quietness, or, but, some, but it's not restricted to that. Because there are all kinds of other activities the demons will try to, try to come on, you know, like you know, shaking and rolling around and all kinds of things which, which are just not, not helpful. And so it's important to restrict that demonic activity on that spot. Now, let me explain this to you. I do not tolerate a lot of demonic manifestation. Some people say, well, you, you know, the demon's there, and of course you expect all this. I don't expect this. And I learned this when I went back to Africa for the first time in 1986 and preached the gospel. 
and there were so many demons and so many demonic manifestations. And I've never done this before. I've always gone in future with a team, and I was on my own at that time. I hurriedly grabbed a couple of people, gave them some quick training, and so we, we set to work. And oh, these demons, they made so much noise, and they went on and on and on and on and on. Until eventually, if I was just analyzing myself, I would have thought I just lost patience with this. But I got annoyed. Thank God it was Holy Ghost annoyance. And I said from that moment onwards, I, I said, I haven't time to deal with all these people this way. It's ridiculous. And so from that moment onwards, when they, they brought the person and I said, now listen here, demon. You're coming out. You're coming out now. You're coming out quietly. Now, of course, uh, you notice in, in 126, Mark 126, it says, when the unclean spirit had convulsed him and cried out with a loud voice, he came out. Now, I'm not talking about the manifestation of the demon leaving. I'm talking about the manifestation of the demon when he's not leaving. And people can get confused and think, well, the demon's got to manifest, so they keep letting the demon manifest. All they're doing is feeding that demon's activity. Also, uh, some of it, a lot of it, can be the person. It's learned behavior. They've learned that when demons are around, people scream, so they start screaming. They've also learned that sometimes people roll and, and all kinds of stuff and thrash around, and, and so they actually... So I, I, I often have stopped the person, say, excuse me, now I don't want to talk to you, I want to talk to the person now. Okay, excuse me, you don't have to do this, you know. Don't yield yourself to this, you don't have to do this. Just be normal. Sit up now. I said, what do you mean, I don't have to? No, you don't have to. Because they were yielding to the demon's dictates. they got to start resisting. And the first thing you need to resist is those kind of unnecessary manifestations. But let me underline again. I'm not saying that it's that... Well, what I am saying is this. When the demon comes out, there may be a manifestation. I mean, I don't mind a scream, ah! and the demon goes, because that's the demon leaving under torment. All right? But it's the ah, 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 for one hour, <laughs> or two hours. All this involvement with the demonic. I, I tell you, friends, stick to the simple Bible principles. Stick to the simple Bible principles. Okay. All right, so Jesus, first of all, restricts. Then it says, be rebuked. He rebuked. And this is the, word, the verb epitemao, to rebuke. And it relates to binding because it means to set a weight upon. And it's used in relation to demons uh, time and time again. And it's this verb that's also used of Simon Peter's mother-in-law. And it's used also of the stilling of the storm. Jesus rebuked the storm, and he rebuked the fever, which suggests, doesn't prove, but it strongly suggests that there was a demonic element to both those things. That fever was a demonic fever. It suggests that that storm was a demonic storm. It doesn't prove it, but it suggests it. Now, if you compare these two verses, I will show you. Mark chapter 4 and verse 39, it says, Then he arose and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace be still, and the wind ceased, and there was great calm. Compare that with Mark 1.25, and Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be quiet, come out of him. Can you see the parallel? Jesus rebukes in both instances, and he rebukes by saying, Be quiet. So he says to the demon who's, who's, who is screaming, Be quiet, which is a form of deliverance, and he says also to the wind, Be quiet. Speaking to the wind, speaking to the storm. Was he speaking to the storm or was he speaking to the demonic element that was bringing that storm, seeking to uh, hinder Jesus in his ministry? Then, of course, the most important one, don't forget this, come out. Don't forget that one. Come out. That expresses it very clearly. Demons, are got, they've got to go. And uh, now, in some instances, we do find Jesus asking a question. Certainly in Mark 9, Mark 5 and verse 9. Then he asked him, What is your name? And he answered, saying, My name is Legion, for we are many. Okay. 
Now, why this question that Jesus asks about the name is not a morbid fascination. Some people say, unless you have the name of the demon, you can't cast the demon out. What's, what's the name? And some people actually have lists of names of demons, uh, not even like lust or pornography or something like that. You know, have all these, all these names, and they, and they teach people to read out these names. Is this your name? Is that your name? As if you can't cast a demon out without finding out its name. Now, the name is not a label. The name is a nature. And when a demon is forced to expose its name, it's forced to expose its nature. And the exposing of its nature is part of the deliverance because it's seen to be exposed by the light. So that's the thinking behind people saying you must have the name. But I, I think they go too far. There's a tiny element of truth in it. So long as you understand that, that the name is, is, finding out the name of the demon is part of the deliverance process. Okay? And even in what I've said there, I've slightly overemphasized it. Uh, so be very, very careful and balanced. Jesus only did that on that occasion. Then also we have uh, a question in uh, Mark's Gospel where Jesus asks, how long has the boy been, been in this condition? Mark chapter 9, and um, Jesus hears about what's happened to this uh, boy. He goes into this seizure and he foams, the mouth gnashes his teeth, it becomes rigid sometimes, you know, he even is in danger. And then he says, uh, um, how long has this boy been in this condition? Now, why did he ask that? How long? How long has he been in this condition? Well, there could be a lot of reasons. Because there's a, there's a child involved, and maybe he's saying, is there, what is the source of this? Is this, is this some hereditary thing? Because if, it, if it's from childhood, that's a very significant thing. Uh, or he could be realizing that this is an ongoing problem, and therefore it is a deeply rooted thing that Jesus needs to minister to at that level of depth. And that brings today's teaching on ministry in the Spirit to a close. I pray that over these programs, God has begun to show you what it means to minister for Him, to be a true servant of Jesus Christ, and to do so in the power and ministry of the Holy Spirit. Till next time, God bless you.